taken into the deeper presence of the Lord uh, through our worship, the awesome presence, nearer presence of the Lord. Thank you for that beautiful word from Isaiah 6, Ruth, and Andrew picking up the song there. Isaiah going into the temple, performing his rotor duty and encountering the living Lord and then receiving the Lord's forgiveness and then um, the Lord saying to Isaiah, who will go? And him responding, Lord, send me, send me. Before the service, as we were praying upstairs, um, a picture developed in my mind's eye, which is still with me now. And it's a, 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 a big tree. It's a big round blossoming tree like this, a huge big round blossoming tree. And all the blossom um, is of a violet purple sort of color, a deep dark color. And as I was holding this image before me, um, I felt drawn into this blossom. And as I came into it, I, sent, I felt increasingly this is, um, this is the darker, sad, sorrowful side of this world, um, which we all know about. The Roma people have one special word that seems to gather up all grief and sorrow and failure and brokenness and whatever else. They call it nekazo. And um, I felt drawn into the middle of this blossoming tree, beautiful, beautiful blossoming tree. And as I came deeper into the middle and stayed there, um, I saw Jesus. And he was the, the crucified risen one there in the middle and shining brightly in the middle of the tree, unseen from the outside, but they're very present in the middle. Um, and as this, this worship's been going on now, um, what I feel the Lord is saying is, take the blossom, take the beautiful fragrance of the crucified risen one, take it having been drawn into the center of that grief, the center of that tree, and take it out into the world. Take it out into the world. Who will go? Lord, send me. Send me. That's why we're here this morning, to receive to, to this. And as I've been preparing for this morning, um, I've been trawling across the scriptures to try and uh, understand the place of Jesus' resurrection in the context of the whole canon of scripture. And the wonderful thing about the Bible, as you get to know it better, is that you realize, although it's of course a collection of lots of different books written by different men over many, many centuries, there is actually a dialogue going on across the centuries. Uh, the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament writers in a very special way. And you, as you get into these um, deep conversations across history, you realize God's Holy Spirit really is breathing through the whole of the Bible. And as we get into it in that kind of way, it's like a mirror of our own lives. Because there's all sorts of deep, sad bits and all sorts of very difficult p passages to keep going through, like, you know, all the kings of Old Testament, <laughs> all that difficult history. Um, and then there are these amazing shafts of light into, into the reality of the human life, yeah? And as we were worshipping now, I was kind of looking around at people and, and, and seeing... People are in different places, and that's okay. We're in different places. Some of us are deep in, in sorrow. Others are right up there, and next week it might be the other way around. And, and that's, that's part of what it means to be a community of faith, isn't it? To grow alongside one another in that way. And as I say, the beautiful thing, the wonder of the Scriptures, is that it gathers up all of that and captures all that, and we travel with the scriptures alongside one another in the power of the Spirit forwards. And over against all of that, we have 
the cold winds of secular humanism out there. Nick Clegg now thinking of disestablishing the church. Maybe that's a good thing, I don't really know, but that's the kind of conversations that's going on in our world. But faith, religious faith, is something private. There are no absolute truths. Everything's relative to everything else. But the Bible confronts us not with a fantasy world, not with a um, a, a make-believe world, but the Bible confronts us with the world, life on planet Earth, as it really is. There are certain things in here that keep coming again and again and again that nobody can say, oh, that's just a private matter. For example, Isaiah 25 Verses. Don't, don't look it up, don't look it up, because I'm going to come back to it later. Um, 7 to 9 speaks of a shroud that enfolds all peoples, a sheet that covers all nations. And that shroud that enfolds all of us, that sheet that covers all nations, is death. That's not a relative thing, that's not a matter of opinion. That's something we all, that box, we all have to tick that to wherever we're coming at it from and say, yeah, well, that is true. Yeah? The one thing we really all agree on is that we're going to die. Genesis 3, not verse 19, after the, the fall, uh, speaks to, the Lord speaks to um, Adam and Eve and tells them that they're going to, fall into the ground and there will be, will be dust to dust and ashes to ashes. Can't escape the reality of that. We're all going to die. And a universal question, wherever you're coming at this from in this world, is, uh, well, where are the dead? What? Okay. Uh, and we modern people know that our bodies get either cremated or get buried and then push up daisies. We all know that, don't we? Uh, uh, but the question, the question of, is there any more to it than that? Do we have a soul? Is there anything that lives on? Is a very real question. And if you happen to, you know, if you have a job like I do, taking funerals for people uh, quite regularly, this question, wherever people are at, in their faith or unfaith or whatever faith, the question of, is there anything more to this than this question, coffin over here is a very real one. It's something that we, we all face, and as we get older, our friends and loved ones die, and we confront these issues. It's a universal question. And the wonder of the Bible is that it takes this question, and it doesn't run away from it. It looks at it head on. We are living this side of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we rightly celebrate he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. But great swathes of humanity lived before Jesus' death and resurrection. Great swathes of humanity have never heard this good news, or it's never, they've never heard it. And the Bible speaks into that. The, and it strikes me that there are three kind of... Uh, responses we can have to this reality. The first I'll call fatalism. You find that there in the book of Job. Right? For example, verse, chapter 26, verse 5, Job cries out to God, the dead are in deep anguish, those beneath the waters and all that live in them. Death is naked before God. Yeah? It's there. The thought is there. Listen in, secular humanists. The Bible doesn't run away from anything. And then in Ecclesiastes 3, and verse 18, reading from there, there's this teacher reflecting on life. He doesn't know about the resurrection yet. And he's saying this, I said to myself, as for human beings, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. 
As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. The human race has no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upwards, and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth? There you've got it. It's in there. I like that. So fatalism. In today's modern scientific world, people who particularly people who've been trained in a scientific way of thinking uh, would say, well, yeah, that is, we, we, we measure what we know and we set our faith on what we know and what we see, empirical evidence, and all the evidence is that we get old, wear out, get ill, and die. So that's what they run with. Kind of harsh realism, the fatalism, that's it, and that's all there is to it. We all know people like that. You may have been one of those people. Perhaps you're here this morning, and that is your worldview. Fatalism. Then there's the approach of escapism. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. What's interesting is that, that slogan, eat, drink, and be merry, before, before tomorrow we die, it's in the Bible. I love that. Isaiah 22, verse 13. Paul quotes it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Escapism. Sometimes I take funerals, and it's as though people simply aren't aware that in the box over there, there's somebody who's died. And they just talk about all the good times, and all the parties, and all the boozing, and all the parties, and wasn't it great? Uh, let's go and have another drink. It is like that. It's a kind of, there's, there are whole communities, you know, relatives who, who are in a sort of escapist mindset. They can't, understandably cannot own what's happened. So fatalism, escapism, and then there's relativism. This is the, this is the, the dominant worldview, really, of the postmodern world we live in. And that's simply, well, you may have your theories, you may have your worldview, you may have your faith position, but actually it's all relative. Nobody really knows anything. So why bother having a discussion about that? Why pay people to be vicars to think about this stuff? Why bother? It's all relative. We don't really know anything. All there in the scriptures. And the wonder of the Bible is, as I'm saying, is that it is realistic, but within the deep realism, there are wonderful flashes of light in the dark sky. Flashes of hope. Flashes of coming from another world. So if I take now with you Isaiah 25, verses 7 to 9, if you want to look that up, it's so exciting. Isaiah 25, 7 to 9. This is the bit about the shroud that covers all people. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people. He will destroy it. The sheet that covers all nations. Verse 8. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign law will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. An amazing flash of light in a dark sky. The realism of the shroud. Yet God is going to do something about that. Hosea verse, chapter verse 13 and verse 14. Here comes another one. Hosea chapter 13. Verse 14. I will deliver them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O oh death, are your plagues? Where, O oh death, is your destruction? Now this can't, these passages, oh, let's just take the next one, one more. 
Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Here we go. 17 to 19. Here it comes. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor they will, will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Another flash of light of hope. This, this narrative of flashes of light in the midst of darkness is a reflection of my story, your story, our story, the reality of life on planet Earth. Now, Jesus was sent into this world. God the Father sent Jesus in this world to live this life. For the shroud to be lifted, Jesus had to take the shroud upon himself. He died our death. His story is our story. And so when he leaves his shroud behind in the tomb and he appears, he comes and walks alongside us in our perplexity, in our grief, in our confusion. And he appears to us beautiful, gentle ways. How many of you watch Rev on the telly? Watch Rev. When is it on? Is it Monday evenings, isn't it? Monday night. Monday night, yeah. Margaret and I just love it. It's about a Rev, a vicar. Okay. I want to tell you what the last... I cannot wait to see what they, what, how they turn it round tomorrow night. But last week, it's about this reverend, right? He works in an inner-city parish in London, in an urban priority area, okay? And uh, he's a very, very real human being, okay? He has a wife, they've had a baby, and he, he, uh, he's out there in the parish, and he commits an indiscretion with the head teacher. Who, she, who fancies him and she fancies, she fancies him and he fancies her, and he commits an indiscretion. The sort of verger of the church catches them when they're kissing. He reports Rev to the archdeacon, who is really an archdemon. <laughs> a, uh, a, an investigation under the bishop's authority takes place as to what really happened. And poor old Rev digs himself a hole and gets deeper and deeper and deeper into it. His wife kicks him out of the vicarage and he sleeps, uh, funnily enough, with, with the verger, who's a bit, of a bit of a naughty boy himself, the one who betrayed him. Anyway, poor old Rev eventually, eventually is allowed back home to the vicarage by his wife. Graciously, she forgives him and takes him back in providing he promises never, ever to do it again. The investigation continues. The archdeacon goes gathering evidence and interviewing people. It reaches the press. It's splattered all over the front page. Poor Royal Rev walks down around the place, and members of his congregation spit in his face. Somebody comes and writes in big red letters across the vicarage door, perv, right? And um, uh, he, he gets, if you've ever had the press say bad things about you, as some of us have, um, I have, then um, it's not a very pleasant place to be, and, and people say like, all sorts of crazy things, and, you know, this truth gets, goes out the window, basically. Anyway, he, he starts to crack under the pressure and lose the plot, and he, he takes a big cross, a wooden cross from his vicarage garden he's supposed to deliver someone. He walks at night through the town with this huge cross collapsing like this and then carrying on. And eventually, in the early hours of the morning, he ends up on the hillside all on his own. 
a broken man. And this, uh, this guy pitches up. He looks like he's got a can in his hand. He looks like he might be a jogger, sort of person you might find out in the early hours of the morning. And, and they start to have a conversation. And they sit down on the bench. And the, the, the man who's pitched up out of nowhere seems to have deep insight into what's going on for Rev. And he meets him in his brokenness. And actually, just before that, they sing, um, what is it, How, what's the song? Lord yes, Lord of the Dance. They sing, and, 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 and the guy who's pitched up knows all the words. And they sing that together, dancing on the mountaintop, and somehow manage to sort of transcend this incredibly tragic situation that's happened. And uh, there they are then on the bench, and this guy's speaking to Rev and helping him put back his life together and giving him a way forward, showing him a way forward. And then the guy steps up and disappears, just vanishes. And you hear some cars go whoosh like that. And, and Rev looks around and, where's he gone? He's gone. And to the believer, it's clear, that was Jesus. The risen Jesus pitched up and met him in his deep, deep grief. If you like, it's a modern retelling of the Emmaus Road story in Luke 24. Okay, read that. Jesus meets us where we are at, not where we think we ought to be. He meets us in the depths of our despair. And Jesus seems to know, the risen Jesus seems to know, that the good news is so good that it's in danger of being too good to be true. Yeah? It's so incredible that he seems to know it's no good me just pitching up and saying, boo, here I am, it's okay now. He doesn't do that. It's he's, though he senses in his spirit, he knows the human spirit, he is a human being. He knows, senses it, it's in danger of being too good to be true. And Jesus, those who saw the risen Jesus and believed, like the apostles, um, had to hear Jesus then say, Blessed are those who believe and who have not seen. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That's us, isn't it? Yeah? Because you see, um, many weren't blessed in this way. Many today are not blessed in this way. Many don't believe and haven't seen. And we know this from 1 Corinthians 15. Here, Paul, you want lots of this up now, 1 Corinthians 15, is absolutely clear that in the early church, this is the first generation or so after Jesus rose from the dead, many, many people do not believe in the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul uh, begins a long, extended argument to take this on. Yeah? Many people although they would have met probably people who had seen the risen Jesus or you know, relatives of them, it was recent history that many don't believe. So 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how could some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? There is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all others. So he goes on. Many 
find themselves unable to believe in the resurrection. This news is too good to be true. We had a guy in my last church called Hubert, a wonderful, gracious, educated man, a poet. Everybody loved him. He was he just retired as the head of English at the school. Just about every woman in Cranbrook was in love with him. He was such a lovely man. And um, he, I, I said, Hubert, it would be lovely if you could join the PCC. It would be so good to have somebody like you on the PCC. So he said, I think about it. He went home and wrote me a note, as only a poet can write a note. And the note said, I'm really sorry, Martin, I can't be on the PCC because I don't believe in the resurrection. Okay. His wife, Diane, who was busy writing a PhD in, in, in uh, nursing, fell ill with cancer at the same time I had cancer. And she died. Very painful death, protracted death. And um, I was busy trying to open a, a garden of remembrance in the graveyard so we could have people's ashes buried there. And I actually managed to do this. Most things I tried didn't work out, but that actually did. And I went to Hubert and I said, Hubert, having taken her funeral, I said, um, Hubert, would you consider having Diane's ashes buried in, as the first person to go into this grave, this garden of remembrance. And he said, oh, I can think of nothing I'd love more. In fact, I'd like to pay for a seat to be placed there in her memory. The seat is still there, usually littered with cans of coke around, but it's there. And here is a dear, dear man who just cannot come to believe in the resurrection. How can I bring the fragrance of the risen Jesus into this man's life? For some people, the good news is so good, it, it, it's too good to be believable. And so I want to, I hope you're with me, um, I want to look now a bit more at 1 Corinthians 15 to see how Paul weaves in two of the passages uh, sorry, the Hosea passage, the one about the shroud, into his narrative. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50 now, how does he do this? Can you see verse 50 in 1 Corinthians 15? I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortality with immortality, then the saying that is written, this is the bit from the scripture, will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory, where, O oh death, is your sting? Get into your Bible. Notice this little footnote. This is from Hosea, the bit about the shroud. Do you see what he's doing? He's taking the, his own scriptures, he's taking that realism of the Old Testament and he's bringing the resurrection of Jesus into that realism. The shroud has been left, lifted. Death, yes, death, but where is your sting? Do you see how he does it? And then he says, verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He weaves the Old Testament realism into the story of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, my friends, look to Revelation 21. Here, here is John writing, the John who's on, in, pretty much in his deep grief out on the island of Patmos, 
And he's given a vision of what is to come. Revelation verse 21, verses 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, beautifully prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now wait for this bit, verse 4. This is the quote from Isaiah uh, 25 I read earlier. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. See how they do it? They take the Old Testament realism, Old Testament flashes of hope, and say, this is real. These flashes of hope are our inheritance and our future. So, my friends, why doesn't God have Jesus appear right now, Monday morning, in the Houses of Parliament? And say, just sit down, Nick Clegg, there's no need for the church to disestablish. Look, here I am. Here is the good news. Death has been swallowed up in victory. See my hands. See my side. <laughs> Maybe he will, Jane. <laughs> Maybe he will. But, but he, Maybe he will. But it's good to ask the question why he hasn't. And this is why I think he hasn't. Because he wants to bless us. And he says that the ones who are blessed are the ones who believe without seeing. Jesus to Thomas. You have seen, you believe, but blessed are those who believe and have not seen. You see, faith is faith because it can live without scientific certainty. Mm hmm Again, it's in the Bible, Hebrews first, chapter 11, verse 1, which I love to paraphrase like this. Faith is believing against the evidence, and there is an awful lot of evidence that there's no more to this life than death. A great deal of evidence. Faith is believing against the evidence and waiting in faith for the evidence to change. And the evidence that we get in this life are these flashes of hope. And our faith is that 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross, rose again. And we are blessed because we believe against the evidence. God gives us flashes of hope. Jesus, in his three years with the disciples, takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, yeah? Up on the mountain, great. We're going to have a picnic with the Lord. Fantastic. Jesus is transfigured. He becomes almost like a supernatural being before their eyes. Moses and Elijah pitch up. They're supposed to have, they died centuries ago. They're in their graves. What are they doing here? Moses and Elijah. Peter, James, and John, what's going on here? Should we make a tent for them, Peter says? A flash of resurrection breaking through the clouds into their lives. Jesus gives them this moment. He does this House of Parliament thing then, almost, doesn't he? He says, Moses, Elijah, alive, talking with me. This has happened to me in my life. Just, but enough for me to believe, having not seen. I've shared it with you. My brother, Jesus, my, sorry, my brother Stephen, when he died in that French hospital when he was 15, his last words were, it's wonderful now. 
Many years later, when I was 40, just about to leave music and go into the, be trained as a vicar, I was wondering what was going on. I was about to play my last performance of music in, in Newcastle, so I went into this church in the afternoon, and I sat down in this church, and I saw Stephen. And he came to me. He gave me a golden key. I felt my body fill with gold. Then he disappeared. Every time, for many years, I took a funeral after that, and there were lots. Every time, just before I went out to the people, I saw Stephen. I don't mean like I'm seeing Andrew now, but he was definitely there. I needed that. I needed something to bring to the people. Some kind of flash of light through the clouds that there is more to it than that body in that box. Stephen's alive. Jesus is alive. We will be raised. And just one final little bit of Bible here. Revelation 22, two verses. Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside, there is an outside, sorry, but there is an outside. Outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The Bible is completely clear that everybody's going to be raised from the dead. We will all be raised, Paul says. Everyone. And it's also completely clear that we'll have a choice whether to accept the gift of eternal life, life that is in Christ Jesus our Lord or to reject it. So we who carry the flame of faith carry a burden. Because if we disclose this to others, we bring them hope that is, faith, hope that is good news, that is so good it's almost un, too good to be true, we bring it to them, we bring the sweet fragrance of the blossom of the tree, but then we give them a choice. They have a choice. They can say no. They can, we can all say no to the good news. And, and, and even seeing face to face, well, we will all see Jesus face to face. Even then, because love can only be loved if there's free choice and free will, even then, we have the choice to say yes or no. Yes, I want to live with you in all eternity or to go my own way. Um, I don't know if this has anything to do with what I've been sharing, but, but when we were praying upstairs, uh, one of us had the feeling, it was Rochelle, that um, God was saying to her, after the service, she, should, she, Rochelle, should meet with three women and maybe anybody else that would want to go and be with them. Now, I know that will be after Wendy's met with the people who are going to Letton Hall, but Rochelle, where are you, Rochelle? She, she's um, not here now. She's there. So Rochelle will be up there after the Letton Hall meeting. And if you feel you're one of the three ladies who's to be with her, go. If you like to be prayed for, yes, does that figure? Then feel free to go to the prayer room. Amen.